Hey guys, it's Miss Sailor here. So we're going to be talking about the Jefferson administration, 1801 to 1809. So the fury over the Alien and Sedition Acts influenced the pivotal presidential election of 1800. The Federalists nominated John Adams, while Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr were the Democratic-Republican nomination. Uh, Jefferson represented Virginia, Aaron Burr represented the powerful state of New York. Now, the Federalists had claimed that Jefferson's election could bring civil war and anarchy. Now, in this election, what we have is the Revolution of 1800. It's the first presidential election in which one political party replaced the other, and it did so peacefully. In a in the election of 1800, Jefferson and Burr, the two Republican candidates, emerged with 73 electoral votes each. Adams only received 65. So, when Burr shockingly refuses to withdraw in favor of Jefferson, the tie vote in the Electoral College is sent to the House of Representatives. This is then corrected with the 12th Amendment uh, later on so it doesn't happen again. So the tie vote creates an explosive political crisis. It takes three months between the House to vote for the President. Uh, it starts in December of 1800, but Jefferson is finally inaugurated in March of 1801. It's so tense that people openly talked about civil war. But the, also understand, uh, it is the one time the party relinquishes its that step over of peace. They're giving up, Adams is giving up peacefully. Um... Jefferson's hard-fought victory signaled the emergence of a new, more democratic political culture dominated by bitterly divided parties and wider public participation. Before and immediately after independence, socially prominent families, the rich, able, and well-born, dominated political life. However, the political battles of the 1790s, with Jefferson's elections on top of that, established the right of common men to play more active roles in governing the young republic. With a gradual elimination of the requirement that citizens must own property to vote, the electoral it, it expanded enormously in the early 19th century. So... Jefferson calls his election the Revolution of 1800, for it marked the triumph of the Republican Party. Uh, three Republicans uh, from Virginia, that is Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, would hold the presidency for the next 24 years. Now, a bitter John Adams is so upset by his defeat, uh, he refuses to participate in Jefferson's inauguration in the new capital in D.C., in fact, what he does do is he quickly passes the Judiciary Act of 1801. He intended to ensure the Federals control the judicial system by creating 16 federal court circuit courts with a new judge for each. It also reduced the number of Supreme Court justices from 6 to 5 in an effort to deprive the next president of appointing a new member. Before he left office, Adams appointed Federalists to all of these new positions. So, he's trying to be very sneaky. And what it leads to is this case. Right? So, in 1802, at Jefferson's urging, the Republican-controlled Congress repeals the Judiciary Act of 1801. Now, in this repeal, that is the midnight judges that were appointed by John Adams, you have gentlemen like William Marbury who did not get their commission before Jefferson became president. So you have Marbury versus Madison. Now, 
Chief Justice John Marshall refused to give Marbury his commission. <clears throat> now, what it does in Marbury versus Madison, uh, the ruling, Marshall and the court held that Marbury deserved his judgeship. However, Marshall denied the Supreme Court had jurisdiction in the case. So, with one bold stroke, Marshall is eliminate is elevating the stature of the court because he's reprimanding Jefferson while avoiding an awkward, con awkward confrontation with the administration. So, what he's doing is that the Marbury decision granted the Supreme Court not mentioned in the Constitution, which is judicial review, whereby the court determines whether acts of Congress and the presidency are constitutional. So, Marshall established that the Supreme Court was the final authority in all constitutional interpretations at that point. Now, understand that Jefferson, when he is in his first term, he does, in, there are some triumphs for him, right? Surprisingly, he does not dismantle Alexander Hamilton's Federalist Economic Program. Now, remember, he deliberately is pushing Republican simplicity, but he does recognize that the National Bank is essential to economic growth, so he keeps it as much as he argues against all of this. But he does, to pay down debt, slash the federal budget in half. He fires all federal tax collectors, and he cuts the military's budget in half. This is important later, that he cuts the military budget in half. He says that state militias and small naval gunboats provide enough protection against foreign enemies. So, Jefferson's was the first national government in history to reduce its own scope and power. So upon assuming the presidency, Jefferson promised peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations. But obviously, that does not always work out. So while Alexander Hamilton always faced East, he was looking to Great Britain for his model of national greatness, Thomas Jefferson is looking to the West for his inspiration. Right? He's looking across the mountains and even across the Mississippi River. Only by expanding westward, he believed, could America avoid the social, social turmoil and misery that is common in the cities of Europe. So, to ensure continuing expanding westward, um, Jefferson and the Republicans continue to reduce the cost of federal lands. He doesn't just reduce the cost of federal lands in places like Ohio. He also sends New Yorker Robert R. Livingston to Paris in 1801 as an ambassador to France. Livingston's primary objective is to acquire New Orleans, uh, situated at the mouth of, mouth of the Mississippi. Jefferson tells Livingston that purchasing New Orleans and West Florida was absolute importance. So, they need New Orleans to have the Mississippi. That's what they were looking for. Now, it stalls out in 1801 and 1802. So, in early 1803, Jefferson has grown concerned about these stalled negotiations. So, he sends uh, future President James Monroe who is his trusted friend and Virginia neighbor. So no sooner does Monroe arrive that Napoleon surprisingly offers not just to sell New Orleans, but all of the immersive, unmapped Louisiana territory, from the Mississippi west to the Rocky Mountains and from the Canadian border south to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the unpredicted Napoleon had reversed himself because of his large army in the Caribbean. There is an issue in the Caribbean right now. There is a revolution going on 
in Haiti. And that is why he is willing to give up Louisiana territory. Uh, his army had been decimated by epidemics, yellow fever, and malaria, and the massive slave revolt led by Toussaint Louverture, who had proclaimed the Republic of Haiti. So, it is the first successful slave rebellion in history, and it panics people. Napoleon tried to regain control of Saint-Dominique, also known as Haiti, because it's a profitable source of coffee and sugar. He was also trying to connect New Orleans and Haiti as the first step in expanding France's North American trading empire. But after losing more than 24,000 soldiers to disease and warfare, Napoleon decides to cut his losses. So he sells Louisiana territory to the United States. He sells it to us for $15 million or three cents an acre. Uh, the new territory doubles the size of the United States. When Livingston and Monroe ask Charles Maurice de Talleyrand, who is Napoleon's negotiator, about the precise extent of the territory they're buying, he basically replied, I can give you no direction. Um, you have made a noble bargain for yourselves, and I suppose you will make the most of it. So, in inquiring Louisiana territory, Jefferson is saying that he's pretty much removed the French threat. So, He's very eager to close the deal, uh, Jefferson is. They do officially take formal possession of the Louisiana Territory December 20th, uh, 1803. The purchase includes some 875,000 square miles of land. Uh, it breaks into six states in their entirety, and for the most or part of nine more. Are going to be carved out of the Louisiana Purchase. It is the most significant event of Jefferson's presidency and one of the most important developments in American history. It spurs Western exploration and expansion, and it even entices cotton growers to settle into the Old Southwest, that is Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Now, I'm going to stop here. And we'll do a part two where we begin to discuss Lewis and Clark.